All right, this week we're talking about The Pretender. Real quick, some nuts and bolts. This was released in 1976, and it's Jackson Brown's fourth studio album. It peaked at number five on the Billboard album chart, and it went platinum a year after its release. This is the first time he had a producer since his first album, and that produ- this producer was John Landau, who had produced Springsteen's Born to Run shortly before that. So he self-produced um, For Every Man and Lay for the Sky. And, and, I've, and I've heard some interviews with Jackson Brown where he talks about the fact that like he didn't necessarily see the need for a producer. He, he was just sort of like, let the songs become the songs, which has some romantic appeal to me, but I also, so does the idea of a producer, kind of into that too. Um, there are tons of different players on this album. There's something really interesting. Like if you look at the back of the vinyl record of The Pretender, it's not like there's an area where it just says like all the people who played on it on every single track underneath it it lists who played on it and if you look they change wildly from track to track like there are tons of people who played on this album this one particularly does like uh jumps around to a lot of different stuff and kind of makes sense there's a bunch of different people playing on it and i don't know if that's a john landau thing or a jackson brown thing in this case Um, This album was ranked number 391 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time, where they noted that his wife committed suicide while he was writing these songs, making them, quote, hard-bitten. So something that I like to do on this podcast is read some, some snippets from the Rolling Stone review that came out at the time with the idea that... It, it was if 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 you want something to react to the to the arts at the time and music in particular, Rolling Stone was the thing doing that in the 1970s. So this one starts off a little bit brutal. It's written by Dave Marsh. Singer songwriter fans find in Jackson Brown the fulfillment of the style's promise. Brown's songs really do merge poetic vision and rock, but there are also those like my friend who suggest that this album's proper title is The Pretentious, who find the genre symptomatic of all of rock's current weaknesses. Brown is the epitome of everything they find disagreeable, both lyrically and musically. I'd say that's pretty pretty ruthless first paragraph of a review for from a magazine that would a couple decades later put it 391 on its top 500 albums of all time it's kind of funny but he finds his way towards more positive things to say as the album as the review goes along ambivalence is the hallmark of his style he has managed to make confusion an advantage partly because he never hedges he knows he doesn't know this is something I absolutely agree with about Jackson Brown and also something I absolutely identify with and love. It's kind of my favorite thing in songwriting is when someone is just they're just they're just contemplating and searching around. They don't have an answer. They're the whole reason the song exists is because they don't have an answer. I love that. And this isn't my favorite of the, of the Rolling Stone reviews that I've read. Some of them are excellent. They just they they're so cool for me to read. They're like time capsules um, from the '70s about a thing that I love. That set of lines about ambivalence as the hallmark of his style. I, I think that nails something, and I love it. If Brown has been heralded as a songwriter, this is due mostly to his lyric gift. The music itself has usually been ignored, and for good reason. His three earlier albums are sluggish and cluttered, a hodgepodge of California studio effects without a solid center. See, that I think is completely bunk. Like what I was saying before, that's just not true. Like even on the first one, like if you listen to my opening farewell, it's like a... It's beautiful musically. That feels like a someone looking from far away trying to make a comment about the three albums that they didn't have to review, whereas they spent a lot of time listening to one that they did, because of course you have to listen to it a lot if you're going to review it. Um, The Pretender uses identical rudiments, but it focuses them. The focus is always lyrical. The arrangements and performances are successful precisely to the degree that they bring our full attention to the emotions and ideas he articulates. As someone who's always had reservations about admiring him, I find that Jackson Brown touches me most deeply when he's most specific and least cosmic. Writing about mortality and parental roles, he is as mature as any writer in rock and more cogent than most. That's another thing I agree with about The Pretender. The Pretender, which my guest and I talk about in this conversation, The Pretender just sort of gets at everyday life and I have a couple of kids now and uh, I'm I'm married and I have a job that has me sort of making my living Monday through Friday and this album 
hits that more than anyone. And, and just the reality is I'm at a time in my life when that is very relatable. And I, I, especially the song, the pretender, which he's going to talk about right now. I think this album just, it does get at that really well. All right, last paragraph. What makes the title track work are its specifics, the way even the junk man pounding his fender becomes a part of this cosmic cycle. The images are tied to a time and a place, as the best of any writer's work is. And the horror is in just such detail. The house besides the freeway, the packed lunch, the work, the endless evenings. Getting up and doing it again, seen this way, is not so very mystical, but simply the way each of us, even the artist, lives his life. So that's the end of the review. As you'll hear in this conversation, I find a lot of that stuff really relatable, as I was alluding to before, which gets us to the guest. The guest is Kyle Cox, who is the vocalist and lyricist for a band called Canaan Road that's based in Southern California. And also, he's my cousin. So part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is because I absolutely love Jackson Brown. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that my dad did. And so did my dad's brother, who is Kyle's dad. And this kind of spread through the rest of us kids. We had five five cousins. We've all written music, and Jackson Brown has been a, a fixture in our lives since our teenage years. And I don't think that would have been the case had my dad not gotten into The Pretender in 1976. So here we are, having a pretty open conversation about The Pretender and all of its songs. So The Pretender comes out in 1976, and some other albums that come out that year are Hotel California by The Eagles. Weirdly, The Eagles' Greatest Hits album, that one with like the cow skull on it that you yeah. see everywhere, that I think was the number one selling album in the world for a long time, also came out that year, which I've seen that Eagles documentary, but somehow didn't know that that came out the same year as Hotel California. That's uh, incredible. Desire by Bob Dylan. Yeah, Desire by Bob Dylan, Black and Blue by the Rolling Stones, Boston self-titled. Um, yeah, so that that sort of puts us in 1976. I know that this album matters to you in particular. Was it what is it about this album that you enjoy? To me, it seems like it stepped away from uh, organic, rootsy, just kind of acoustic guitar, and kind of moved more towards. How can we make this a little more commercial? I, someone who basically put out three albums of being sort of this introspective California kid behind a piano singing ballads, even though that oversimplifies what he did. He wasn't just doing that on those three albums, but it sort of feels like he did. Something about The Pretender feels like it's like going up a couple notches or something, right? Yeah, there was definitely a, a step uh, higher uh, in the fidelity of the album. I know that he brought in John Landau, and I know that it was sort of a concerted... That That's a deliberate thing if you bring this person who made like basically a pop rock masterpiece with Bruce Springsteen, and Br Bruce Springsteen, who's sort of your ultimate like live show rock and roll guy. But when you actually listen to the album, I mean, it goes... It, it slows down pretty quickly after the start, and there's plenty of... It's arguably just as mellow as For Every Man or, or the self-titled first album. But something about, I think, the fact that it starts with the fuse, it almost, like, announces itself. Whereas, like, uh, Late for the Sky that comes before it is starting you pretty slow and heavy. And this album basically bookends itself with the fuse, which is kind of more produced than anything yeah. you've really heard him ever do. And then the pretender, which is kind of like feels connected to the fuse in its own way, but in like the biggest sort of epic possible way. Like it feels yeah. like the thesis statement of the album or something. I mean, I guess it is. It's the self-titled yeah. the title track. But. And, you know, and, and it is a slower album. I've read up a, a lot on it. And one of the major critiques about this al album that I've read is, you know, I thought this album was going to be more rock and a step step in the other direction. Uh, so it's like, come on, where's, you know, where's this, where's more of this redneck friend and, and, and songs like that, Doctor My Eyes, I want something I could kind of groove to. But I feel like this album was more Jackson Brown uh, staying true to himself versus um, doing what the listener 
uh, or, or maybe what the new listener wanted to hear, the, just the radio listener wanted to hear. He kind of stayed true to uh, fans that have been fans since the beginning. He really, uh, you know, kind of uh, forced everyone to come in and listen with, uh, again, deliberately with, with the sound of the album as well as those bookend songs like you're talking about, starting the album with The Fuse and then Bright Baby Blues and then Linda Paloma. I mean, those three songs could have been on any number of different albums from him. You know, it's kind of odd three yeah. songs put together in the first place. So yeah, it's true. Those those three songs feel completely unrelated from in, from each other, and it it sort of settles into a stride that feels a little more connected after that. But certainly, you kind of if if you think you're jumping into like Jackson Brown's pop rock crossover, the fuse might make you feel that way for four minutes, but then it's pretty quickly like mm, that's not exactly what this is. I think a lot of decisions were probably made, at least from Jackson Brown's. Uh, standpoint uh, based on what was kind of occurring in his life and I don't know how long exactly he was into the recording of the album but I do know specifically like there's uh, you know here come those tears again and I don't know if you're going to want to talk one song to the next in in this segment but um, I know that that song kind of was spurred by his his wife's mother who kind of brought some lyrics to him and ask for inspiration in writing that song with him. Yeah, it's like they're they're technically co-writers on that song, right? Right. And I think the story goes that she actually had some lyrics written about something or, or like a relationship that happened with her and brought it to Jackson saying, hey, you know, I've got these lyrics. I would love for you to uh, help me kind of put a song together and I want to see what you'll do with them, that kind of thing. That might be my favorite song on the album. Some of these songs, especially in the sort of exercise of doing this podcast, which just sort of makes you listen to music in a different way, which... Sometimes for better or for worse. Sometimes you should just listen to music, but also where there's there's a lot to chew on with Jackson Brown's music that it's kind of fun to listen to it as like a I'm gonna sort of poke and prod at this and really get yeah. into it. And some of these songs that I actually didn't know were some of my favorites have become that in the process of doing that. You also have the benefit of like first hearing them at the age of sixteen, seventeen years old, and sort of connecting with them through the t- through your twenties, and then hearing them as a thirty five, thirty six year old, and it's like, all right, like some of this stuff is now, some of this stuff is like stuff that isn't just artistically written and interesting. This is like straight up real, right? And uh, here come those tears again is one of those for me. And I didn't know here come those tears again was a single. I think it was the lead single. It, yeah, it um, was. That's the song right there that really makes me uh, like get get the goosebumps. That one and, and probably uh, Sleep's Dark and Silent Gate and Daddy's Tune. Those are probably my, uh, even your Bright Baby Blues, which I love that song. It's it's so hard to like pick them, but yeah. Let's let let's do that. Let's go. Let's. Uh, I'm kind of doing these however the conversation goes, but sure. let's go to your Bright Baby Blues and and we can. And well, real quick, here come those tears again, which we'll have covered. Is I, I interestingly, it wasn't one of my favorite ones as a kid when I was younger. Which we are very much in the minority, by the way, of people who were listening to Jackson Brown when we were teenagers. Like right. that is, <laughs> like people are listening to like Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and The Doors and things that you can find on like T-shirts at Hot Topic. But right, big time. I think we have our parents, specifically your dad, to thank for that. And uh, you know, very much. I think your your dad really. Uh, really heard what this guy was doing and I think was an inspiration for your dad to write and play and stuff at a young age as well. So I think um, naturally that really trickled down to us. Something we talked about before this is we have a set of cousins who all play music and a lot of them come from a sort of a technical side, whether they're playing guitar or drums and things. And you and I have kind of gravitated toward the less perfect but more song-centric side. And there's no doubt that that's also where my dad came from, which probably explains the Jackson Brown connection and uh, the Pretender, I love this first five album run by Jackson Brown, but The Pretender is not my favorite. It is your favorite, and it's almost like The Fuse, 
kind of like in my 20s, I was listening to this really lo-fi songwritery music, and the fuse sounded a little too perfect to me. But it didn't take long for me to realize, like, no, this is actually perfect. This is awesome. <laughs> this is totally cool. Like, you get over whatever sort of preconceptions you have about that. Right. And yet, when the song rounds the corner and gives me your Bright Baby Blues right after, it, like warmed my heart entirely like i right. l- absolutely love that song your bright baby blues i would say um like single-handedly uh really kind of ignited kanan and i uh my big brother kanan and i uh where we were at when i was really digging into jackson brown and specifically this album and listening to it a lot i just get hooked on things like that and your bright your bright baby blues just the entire song and the way it was recorded and the instruments used um, it just sounds like somebody captured him sitting on the side of the road watching the trucks roll by kind of thing. I'm sitting down by the highway, down by that highway side. Everybody's going somewhere, riding just as fast as they can ride. That song jumps in just perfectly. It is just perfect start to that song. Yeah. And that song is brutal as it goes on. Like, that's a person hitting a a low. Like, it is a sad-feeling song. I I read something that, uh, where where he says, uh, um, like, uh, you know, try a few of these. But you could definitely tell he was at a point in his life during the writing of that song where it's like, you know, um, am I going to make it out of this and, and, and all of that? This isn't a person who writes happy songs writing a sad, sad song. This is a person who this is a person who writes sad songs and this one feeling sort of especially dark. Like, it feels heavy. Heavy is a great word for Jackson Brown in general. Because even, he, even when he's writing kind of an upbeat song, there's still a lot of heavy and weighty things going on in his in his songs lyrically the way i've put that in my head which basically says the same thing you just said is that he's basically perpetually uncertain he's it's no, he's never going to give you anything just clearly perfectly optimistic that that optimistic thing is also going to have a some hesitation and some lack of certainty and then if he gives you a sad song his you, you're you're going to at least find some glimmer of something but I love that. I think right. I live in that. Uh, yeah. I think I, as human beings live in that space. So Right. Uh, when you see the name of the song, you know, uh, or your bright baby blues, I feel like I'm about to hear like a little nursery rhyme or, <laughs> or something like that. Sound- or just a total lovey-dovey type of song. <laughs> Sounds like the happiest possible song. That's true. Let's jump to Linda Paloma, which Linda Paloma is a song I've always wanted to talk about with people. I basically <laughs> straight up categorically in my like – late teenage years and early 20s thought Melinda Paloma was basically an abomination. Like, Melinda Paloma should not <laughs> not exist on it. Like, I, I think it's... It just, to me, was, like, why is this in this place? I actually skipped it for a long time, like, on yeah. CDs. Like, in the period of, of listening to CDs, I skipped it almost every single time. And I'm actually glad that I did because it's sort of, like... I skipped it and saved it for a time when I became more mature and was able to appreciate Linda Paloma, which I actually do now. I actually like like Linda Paloma. At the moment the music began And you heard the guitar player starting to sing You were filled with This album does track one, two, and three, and they're all totally different things. You basically feel kind of rudderless. You don't know what this album's going to be after Linda Paloma. And I think that's my problem. I think if Linda Paloma came at me on track seven or something like that, I might might have accepted a little more early on. But what was your, what's your 
feeling about Linda Paloma <laughs> then and now, I guess. Yeah, I would say very, very much uh, in line with, with your thinking of it from all the way back to, um, you know, when I first got into Jackson Brown. Um, I, I, I would claim that it was probably the worst song I'd ever heard on a Jackson Brown album. I was the same guy. I was skipping it every single time I was listening to the album. After going, you know, when you asked me to do this, I started listening heavy into Jackson Brown again for the last couple of weeks. And uh, I found myself really enjoying Linda Paloma for the first time. And I, and I started kind of digging into some of like, uh, you know, the history behind the album and stuff. And, um, and, I, and I found something that said that he had kind of written a song about this this Mexican food restaurant that him and his girlfriend were, uh, you know, it was kind of a regular place they'd go. And it was just kind of this um, really authentic Mexican food restaurant. I don't know the name of it or where it is. And here's like a bright little moment for me and my girlfriend and kind of what it feels like on a Tuesday night to go out to dinner with my wife or something like that. So when That's I had cool. that... I didn't know that. Yeah, when I had that like that idea in my head listening to it, I'm like, you know, absolutely. You know, like that, to me, that now it makes sense why he would have included that on the album. I think some of the songs on the, this album are a lot older. Uh, Your Bright Baby Blues being one. I, I think he's been doing that song uh, f for many years before The Pretender was even recorded and finally got a chance to put it on an album. Uh, the only reason I know that is there's footage of him doing that in like 1973 or 74 on stage with the Eagles. And if you listen to the lyrics he's singing in that video, they're completely different than than ended up on the album. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. And That's basically like the coolest thing in the world to me is to see that. It's to see like a half-baked song being played in public with like the Eagles casually singing in the background of it. That's just <laughs> totally insane. Right. That documentary. What's the documentary called again? A Going Home. Jackson Brown going home. My final thought on Linda Paloma is you can trust Jackson Brown to give you the bones of something that's worth your time. I like the idea of an album as sort of a cohesive whole in some way. And so as much as I want to, like, I I understand Linda Paloma and have come to like it, you could do something to make it feel like it fits a little better. Sure. That said, I, I've come to like it. I think there's this phenomenon that I'm like, I'm making myself think about the whole entire time that I have these conversations you talk about jackson brown songs on sort of a jackson brown song curve basically you're judging jackson brown against late for the sky and take it easy and something fine and all these amazing songs like he he's 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 stuck in his own curve and sorry but linda paloma is going to get graded on that curve too <laughs> correct <laughs> so <laughs> all right so we already talked about we already talked about here come those tears again Tell me, am I alone in grouping The Only Child and Daddy's Tune together in a way that I really like on this album that they come back to back because it's a song called The Only Child and a song called Daddy's Tune. And like when you talk about production and everything like that, they feel sort of like similar in style and tempo and everything for whatever. I absolutely love both of these two songs. Yeah. And I think they like are, they kick off the sort of B-side of a vinyl record in the perfect way. I, I've never talked to anyone about this, but I don't know, like, am I alone in connecting those two, or do you hear them independently? In... Uh, to me, like, The Only Child sounds like him talking either to himself as a young boy or talking uh, to his kid and just uh, kind of letting him know kind of what he's uh, up against in the world. And then, uh, you know, that we could skip to Daddy's Tune. But yeah, I, for me, The Only Child uh, is just incredible message in that song and it just feels like he's had enough uh experience in the world and kind of seeing the world and we were all at my brother's wedding i was probably over talking to you or someone else and i just sort of hear in the background boy of mine as your fortune comes to carry you down the line and you watch while the changes unfold. And you saw. And in my head, I'm just like, wait, who is, like, this DJ seriously about to play, like, a, a deep cut off the Pretender right now? You're right. And it's like, oh my God, this is my brother dancing with my mom to this Jackson Brown song. 
and it was like sort of the thing that made so much beautiful sense that I had no idea was coming and yeah I always really liked this song and it kind of was I liked that it sort of gifted me this like other special connection to this song that was super cool daddy's tune like the way daddy's tune goes from its slow part to its fast part is just like perfect songwriting dynamics like yeah when it kicks into the like daddy i want to let you know somehow part is just like there's nothing more satisfying than that Couldn't and agree i think more. that like i think that like jackson brown like when you say the word like quote unquote songwriting it's easy to think about it as like poems and lyrics and stuff but i think part of his greatness in songwriting is stuff like that like stylistic arrangement and making sure things like hit and affect the way you want them to affect and this song is awesome for that and then you get into that groovy thing towards the end you know uh, where you know uh, but he's still but it's still deep you know it's still really Leaving deep so much still left to say but daddy i want to let you know somehow that part where he gets to the make room for my 45s alongside your 78s, nothing survives, is like a, him talking to his dad is also in the next generation going to be his kid talking to him. Like nothing survives. It's like we just do nothing survives except the way that we live our lives. Like right. we're all doing different versions of this same thing. And it's, it's a very Jackson Brown sort of high rock moment in a song that's still like this dude is sitting there thinking right and then uh like and then you can hear bonnie Raitt singing background a lot on this song for me the more he includes her on his albums the better and i just love it that you can hear that a lot on this album but a lot on daddy's tune something i honestly didn't know like i always thought of like he made saturate before using then david lindley came in on the second album and then he made five albums with david lindley and whatever band but like the pretender is like basically like drummers are different from song to song like guitarists it is it is seems like it was made with a bunch of different people which kind yeah. of makes sense in some of the sound stuff we talked about like if you, i'm looking at the record right now and basically like it has the track listing on the back of it and then basically like five lines of who collaborated with him on each song all the way down it and they're different from song to song almost like the way like rappers use producers and stuff like that like it's totally basically every song was a like a different artistic effort with different collaborators and tons everything. of different people you could see so we jump from daddy's tune to sleeps dark and silent gate which is <laughs> i honestly didn't it didn't totally occur to me until today that sleeps dark and silent gate is like two and a half minutes long right it's super short <laughs> and like that song is something totally special what's that song to you uh, like it's probably one of my top five favorite songs from Jackson Brown. Period. I, I love the moment in the very beginning where it takes a while for the drums to come in and for the song to actually kind of get going. What you would typically do to build up toward what this song builds up to would be like do something slow for a long time before you get to the part where it builds up to something big. Like an exaggerated version of that is like Bohemian Rhapsody or something, right? Like Bohemian right. Rhapsody is just like hitting one piano key at a time. And then by the end of it, it's just going out of its mind in a way that's just awesome and crazy. This song kind of does this. I, it's, I honestly can't think of a comparison, but he sort of does this like first lot, first set of lines, like where he says the title of the song in them lets it ring and that's all mellow and then it kind of almost feels like dead air for a little while and then basically jumps into the part that would typically come three minutes into the song like basically like he gives you the mellow part of the song basically in one line and then boom he's into this song so then that song can end after two and a half minutes like and i think you take it for granted because you hear the full song but it's crazy that like that's totally weird and random that he does that. When you listen to that pause in it, you're like, "Wait, did my <laughs> did is my stereo turned off? Like, what's going on here?" Like, you could tell it like it gives itself a couple beats to be like, "No, make them wait a minute." Right. We'll come back. But when those drums come in, I get the chills. 
And, and then the chills stay throughout the song, and it's just because that when it gets to that that uh, heavier point in the song, um, and then it kind of lets you down again just to, to end it. It's like it's like I just experienced a whole movie in two minutes. That's how I feel after I hear that song. It's kind of uh, you know he just takes you real high and then drops you at the end. There are certain Jackson Brown songs that I love and don't necessarily know what they're getting at. And there are certain ones that I love and I know exactly what they're getting at. The pretender is basically like the sort of, even if you think you found happiness or even if you know you found happiness, like you know you love the people around you, there's still this like contemplation of what you should be doing to make sure that you're living a life that matters. It doesn't come away with any definitive answers like we talked about, but it's like, describing a person kind of ambiguously that is existing in that space. I, and I just think it's like a ridiculously cool song. I, there's this part in it. So it starts at the one, one minute, 44 second mark that is like caught between the longing for love and the struggle for the legal tender, which already says a lot. Like that's like the legal tender right. is like money. And so, so you hear the word legal tender, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the rhyme of pretender for another 45 seconds after that. <laughs> Incredible. Caught between the longing for love and the struggle for the legal tender. Where well, the sirens sing and the church bells ring and the junk man pounds his fender. He knows that all his hopes and dreams begin and end there. That's just really, really good. That's just really good stuff. <laughs> and it's again, it's him like uh, explaining kind of uh, so many different little things that. You know, if you take a walk outside for a while, you're going to see all these things, you know? That's the part of the song I can't wait to get to when I start the song, for sure. Yeah. It just feels like a song about the ordinary human struggle, right? Yeah, Which... this is years and years before we or the years before we were born when it was written and stuff. It's still like the same playing field that he's speaking about. So it's like timeless, too. Kanan bought a, uh, um, a lap steel years ago. And he's trying to learn it. It was really hard for him. We were really into Jackson Brown and listening to all the tasty stuff that David Lindley was doing on that instrument and a lot of Jackson Brown's albums. And uh, during that time period, we were in a rental house in in uh, Marietta out here, and uh, we were uh, working at In and Out Burger. We were um, working a lot of the same shifts, getting off at two in the morning, and then going home and then staying up until five, six in the morning writing songs. And Kanan, and a lot of it was uh, me on the acoustic and Kanan trying to figure out that lap steel. And we were listening to Jackson Brown like crazy. So some of these albums really, uh, especially The Pretender for me, because when I listen to this music and I think about it, that's where it takes me back to that time period in my life. So if Jackson Brown's music is anything... It is extremely nostalgic, but Jackson Brown has always been that that 
that artist for me. Well, I'm really glad we got to talk about this album. I love talking about music with you, as I've said, and I fully enjoyed this. Jess, I, I really, really enjoyed it, and I appreciate you having me on and doing this because it's uh, Jackson Brown and his music, huge passion of mine, and 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 uh, I thank you for doing this. All right, dude. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jess. And now we'll call my dad, Dana Cox. All right, so if I understand correctly, the first Jackson Brown album you got into was The Pretender. Is that true? And if so, how did that happen? Uh, Yeah, actually it is. I had liked the Jackson Brown tunes. Jeff used to listen to uh, Saturate Before Using. I remember some songs off that. But uh, I remember distinctively in my apartment just kicking back, putting on the headphones. I put on, and in those days, the rock station was uh, KMET. And I was on my couch just kicking back. And he said, we're going to play Jackson Brown's new album, start to finish, no commercials, no interruptions. You got to listen to this. And I thought, okay. So I remember laying on the couch. Real quick as you go. So Jeff is your older brother. So you had you had enough of an introduction to know like through that and some of his songs to say, all right, I'm going to listen to this. Yes. I knew I liked him, but I never got into him. I was listening to uh, Cat Stevens, a lot of country music and different stuff at that time. And so, and KMET is the rock station where? In LA. It was like the rock station, the Mighty Met. I love the idea that they play an album all the way through like that. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Was that a thing that happened frequently then? Or was that like a, wow, this is cool and unique. I'm going to give it its time. I think I think they did that with when when a band would come out with a new album they would do that. It, it changed my life. I'm not kidding. That when that was done and I had just started playing guitar maybe that a year before that, so I was into the music and that just opened up so many doors, you know, creatively. There's like a real gift about like hearing songs that are super interesting and you really like them but also feel like Oh, I can hear a strummed acoustic guitar. Like I can, I can play these songs. They're not like unplayable. I can learn them as a new guitarist. That was a real plus too, because I could handle the three chord G, C's, and D's. <laughs> it's kind of a common thing that like folk type music and punk music have in common. They're very different things, but they're both kind of like simple, basic chords at their at their like basic foundation. And that's why a certain type of person who's not like super technically inclined, like I'm not super technically inclined either. And I've, I've decided that the reason I've been attracted to both those things is that reason is it's like you make the coolest thing you could possibly make with your super simple ingredients. Exactly. And like Jackson Brown is case in point that you can make really amazing things. And I think I was one of the, I, the lyrics where I really listened to lyrics in a song. I think prior to that, I yeah, I was listening to Dylan and all that, and but his lyrics got to me. I mean, and then immediately, you know, I I was hooked. I went, got into all the albums and yeah. What Kyle, what Kyle and I talked to and talked about in our conversation is that so lyrically he's amazing across the board, but this one for some reasons, something about it, it's like directing itself at like middle class everyday American life. It just does a good job of talking about that in a way that is, it just feels very relatable to someone like me at least. And I imagine it did to you at that time. Well, you know, he was born and raised in Southern Cal. We had the same stomping grounds and, you know, his mom was an elementary school teacher that, uh, my sister had had her class. So, and, and, you know, he was, like I said, he was in Echo Park there and I had recently started a job as a route salesman and I was, you know, that was my sales route. All the, a lot of these places he mentions in the songs and I just felt a bond with him a lot because of that too, you know. Like you had a sales route, so you're driving around LA on the freeways and everything. Were you listening to his songs and this music at that time after getting into Pretender? Constantly. That's that's all I did. You know, I'll throw this in. It would, that was 76, I believe. It was, it was the same year I started a new job that was a an outside sales job, which gave me freedom from the 8 to 5 that I used to have. And I started smoking pot that year. I started playing guitar. I mean, like, everything all happened, like, in that year, year and a half, that, I, you know, complete change for the better, much yeah. more creative. and. I'm going to rid myself of how 
in the shade of the freeway. Gonna pack my lunch in the morning and go to work each day. And when the evening rolls around, and he's talking about people living their lives and building their families and having their jobs. There's like multiple songs about relationship with their parents and their relationship with their kids. Yeah. And more so than any of his previous three albums feels like, uh, where do I fit into like the grind of society or something? Yeah. 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 Do you have a favorite song on the album? It's, it's like, yes and no. I mean, it's like, like, do I have a favorite album? You know, I have to say yes and no, the pretender. Yes. Cause it affected me. This, that time of my life, everything about that. But like on this album, I was thinking, you know, I love uh, Daddy's Tune, Sleeps Dark and Silent Gate, um, o- Only Child. I've like tried to think about what my favorite song on this album is. And like, I love Sleeps Dark and Silent Gate and Your Bright Baby Blues. And I, as I contemplate one of those being my favorite song, I realize like it's impossible for my favorite song not to be just the pretender. The song is hey. like, it's just a ridiculously good song absolutely and i i think i'm lying to myself if i say one of those is better than it right exactly even even the album cover you know it just there he is you know walking down the street there and the pretender and just everything about about that album cover and the album is perfect i had a conversation in the last episode of this about late for the sky about how like just super cool and artistic that album cover is and if you look at pretender it seems like a little more like it's a picture of him walking down a busy street. This that's really beyond that. That's all it is. Yep. But if you listen to the but if you listen to the pretender and everything it's talking about, it's like I'm a person in the busy world thinking about what I mean in this busy world and that's it's a reflection of that. This process of like doing this show, this podcast has made me realize even more so than I already knew how much it made me think about music about how much his way of writing made me think about music because I care a ton about lyrics and this Jackson Brown is like beyond my comprehension but yeah. also he is putting together catchy songs you know? take good care of your mother when you're making up your mind should one thing or another take you from behind so Kevin is your brother who you also played music with, played a lot of lead guitar and stuff in various bands he played in. How how did like this spread to him and then spread to their kids? Like how is Jackson Brown of all people someone that our family all has like listened extensively to? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, you know, when I started playing guitar, you know, Kevin and his girlfriend and my girl would sit around and play and then he he started playing harmonica. And he got to be very good fast. So that was fun. Then he said, I said, you got to play guitar. So I taught him how to play guitar like after a year. And he started playing lead. You know, I was always a rhythm player. And he started playing lead and we just jammed. I mean, we would play five hours a day every day till two or three in the morning. And, you know, we were playing Jackson Brown tunes and he got turned on to it. And, you know, it went from there as well as many other artists and originals and then we even got a band you know um and then as you know when we started having kids we were listening to all of jackson brown all these all you kids were raised with it playing constantly and then when you guys all learned how to play music uh, everybody gravitated to Jackson Brown. It was pretty cool for me to watch. So so if you heard this when it came out and then went back to his music and got like into him more, can you remember when like Running on Empty came out after it? Do you have any – when it was like, okay, he's got a new album coming out. What's – I wonder what this is going to be. Yeah, it absolutely. I, I remember in my apartment, I mean, I, I was anticipating that album. I remember buying the album, listening to it with Kevin and Lori and – all of us, and we're blown away, just freaking blown away. And I remember saying to Lori, you know, I'm so glad this album was this great because you always wonder, God, how are they going to follow that last one up? You know, and he sure he sure did, you know. And I, I love a lot of the stuff after, too, you know. It's like it changed, but 
there were some great albums, I'm Alive, and, you know, and that's a lot of stuff you guys were listening to when you were little kids, probably around the house. Weirdly, I'm Alive is probably actually my introduction to Jackson Brown, but then right. we had a we had a Greatest Hits Jackson Brown album that I would listen to, we listened to a lot, and that was kind of like how I got into him. You know, imagine when I went back and bought the other albums, I mean, I was just blown away too by Lake for the Sky and the self-titled album and for every man. I mean, I love all of them. I have found multiple bands in my life where I'm like, Oh my God, how come I wasn't listening to this? And then what you get to do is go back and listen to the other things they made. And if they're great, it's like you got more music than you even know what to do with. And that had to be that experience with Jackson Brown. Anything, anything you feel like you want to tell us about Pretender before we wind this down? It was a, a turning point in my life, musically, in in many positive ways. And uh, boy, I remember it like yesterday, you know. I'm glad that station played it in full. I'm glad Jeff played those songs early on. And I'm glad that you introduced it to us because it's been the same thing in my life. And it's been fun. Right on. Kind of like going through it in this process. Awesome. And, and your podcasts are fantastic. And I think uh, what you're doing, it makes a difference. You know, a lot of people are going to really appreciate it. I, like, I hope it's a way people can discover it. I'm not, I, I can't say confidently that it is, but I hope it is. But I definitely can say definitively it's a thing that people who already love it have appreciated. Cool. Well, cool. Thanks for talking. I'm glad we talked about it, and I can't wait to share this one with you and Kyle on it. All right. Hey, thanks for including me. Awesome. See you later. All right, later. Okay, so thank you to my cousin Kyle Cox and to my dad Dana Cox for joining me on this show. I was really excited to do The Pretender with members of my family. Next week is Running on Empty, and there's a ton to talk about for that one. So make sure to subscribe to the podcast, rate and review it if you want to. Thanks again. It means a lot that you're listening.